A few more people coming in. It is the top of the hour, but we'll wait, pause just a moment. <laughs> Thank you all for joining us. I can go ahead and let people in, Julia, while you okay. get started. Okay. Well, officially, 11.01 on my time. <laughs> I guess that's uh, 15.01 <laughs> uh, UTC time our standard time by which we measure everything PEI. <laughs> uh, so welcome to Polar Educators International Summer 2021, Polar Education Hlalborth, uh, which is our version of a loaded table of free virtual events for educators and science communicators and um, interested others around the world. Um, we are celebrating our online path towards PEI's fifth international conference, which will take place in Holven, Iceland, uh, the 11th through the 15th of April, 2022. We were disappointed we had to pause on our conference for this year, but uh, we are very excited that we can offer you all these great events leading up to then. Uh, for anyone who's new to PEI, we were founded in 2012 and, and um, formed during the International Polar Year as a direct outcome of the conference in Montreal, IPY conference in Montreal, from knowledge to action. Uh, our mission, we've been working very diligently on updating. Uh, by leading dialogue and collaboration between educators and researchers, PEI aims to highlight and share the global relevance of polar regions. A PEI member is anyone interested in making the polls accessible and promoting understanding and stewardship of the polar region, seeking to grow in polar literacy. So if that applies to you and you're not currently an official member, um, please feel free to visit our website and uh, click on the Get Involved tab, I think it's listed. Um, you can communicate with us at Polar Educators. Uh, we are also on Facebook. Um, we have yeah, hashtag leading up to Iceland, um, yeah, hashtag PEI Holbo 2021 and Polar Education. So we're on Instagram, Facebook, and Twitter. And of course, please email us if you would like to get more information. So I am very, very pleased that we are starting off with this event. Uh, Let's see, we have with us our special friends that are going to host our trip to Iceland. Um, yes, Odor Sigurdsson uh, and Kolbrun uh, Haldot. Oh, I'm sorry, <laughs> I get tongue tied. Kolbrun, would you say your last name for me? <laughs> yes, Kolbrun Thank you. You say it so much better than I'm trying to. Yeah, yeah I'm sure. <laughs> <laughs> okay, so Okdor was born in Northern Iceland. We don't have to worry about the dates. He's graduated from the University of Uppsala in Sweden, uh, worked for over 30 years with the National Energy Authority on geoengineering and glacier research. I have to say it that way. I PEI on my trip <laughs> would be mad at me if I said it the American way. Uh, since 2009, he's continued his work with glacier research for the Icelandic Meteorological. Uh, Colbrin uh, is teacher with a master's degree in open education with an emphasis on computer and information technology. She's been teaching in primary and secondary schools for decades, now mainly working as an ambassador for eTwinning, a community of schools in Europe that offers a platform to communicate, collaborate, and develop projects. She's initiated many projects with eTwinning with an emphasis on polar science. She's traveled around the world, I'm sure with some company, <laughs> and hiked on glaciers all over. Colburn and Ochtura attended PEI workshop in Coimbra, Portugal in 2013, and have been with us since then at all of the PEI workshops. They've collaborated in educating school classes in Iceland about Arctic and Antarctic, and maintain an Icelandic website uh, with information related to polar science. Uh, Colbrin has been on our PEI council for the past two years, and of course, by default, so has Ochtur. So we welcome them, and um, 
who are excited to see their presentation and learn more about our destination for next year. Can we have the screen shared? So do we you should be able to do it uh, at the bottom there. Mm -hmm. We apologize for the pause. We are using our new PEI Zoom account, so mm -hmm. still working out the bugs. <laughs> Let me make you co-host just in case. It's a host disabled participant screen sharing oh. says here. That's weird because it says it's available there, but let's try that. You should be the host now. All right. Thank you. Do you see the screen now? Are you? No, uh, not yet. Not yet. Not yet. Very good. Okay. Thank you. Okay. Mm -hmm. Now it's yes. Now. Yes. So now. Okay. Now we're there. All right. Now. Okay. Um. A short introduction to Iceland, the land of ice and fire, its people, and the people's culture. It is uh, an old, or not a very old uh, poem that goes in Icelandic. Land thjóð og tunga, þrenning sönn og ein, þér var ég gefin barna og móður knie, ég lék hjá þér við læk og blóm og stein, this means that the land, people, and language are a holy trinity and one. And I was given to you as a child on my mother's knee. I played beside you by stream and flower and stone. You led me into your high temple of your word. So this is what the Icelanders are born to and brought up. Uh, and I will try to give you some uh, explanation uh, or, or uh, information about the land, the nation, and the language. <clears throat> because a nation will not evolve without the land it lives on or its in, uh, living nature, nor independence of, independent of its language. Thus, we will be trying to give you a snapshot of the land, people, and language. Iceland is a coincidence of uh, two major uh, megastructures on the planet. One is the mid-ocean ridge, which rises, the mid-ocean ridges rise up to about two kilometers above the mean floor depth. And then there is another uh, feature that is called mantle plume, which there are of about 20 to 30 on the uh, planet. And one of those large mega uh, or large uh, mantle plumes coincides with a, a mid ocean ridge and raises that part of the seafloor by two more kilometers. So it is rising four kilometers above the mean sea level. And that is, uh, means that it emerges from the surface of the, uh, of the ocean and is the largest part of ocean floor that is visible by naked eye. And that is Iceland. Now, uh, Iceland is just a spreading, part of the spreading seafloor. And that means the, the geology and the nature is quite different from most, if not all other countries in the world. And here is the mantle plume that holds up Iceland above the sea uh, surface. <clears throat> this is what Iceland looks at uh, like from space. 
And you see that on the on the east coast, it's indented with fjords as well as on the north coast and on the west coast. But the south coast is entirely without indents of that kind because the many big glacier rivers is carrying are carrying sediments, uh, immense amounts of sediments to the coast. And that is making the coast very even and completely without harbor. And of course, we have living nature in Iceland. Here's a moth that is one of the largest insects in Iceland, not very large by comparison, but there are other insects down here, as you can see, small fly, and it is only one thousandth of the size of the other one. Now, Iceland is uh, the result of volcanism. We have about 30 active volcanic systems at present. And, and uh, uh, we have on the average more than 30 volcanic eruptions per century. That means there is less than three years between eruptions on the average. And 10 to 15 of those subglacial eruptions per century will erupt subglacially. And the um, uh, volcanic material output rates is larger than five cubic kilometers per century. Now, this is one of the volcanoes and it is, as you can see, entirely covered with a glacier. It is a huge caldera on the top and it's filled with, uh, it's about 11 kilometers across and filled with about 850 meters thick ice. So if you get a volcanic eruption in there, you will have enormous floods. And every now and then, as I told before, we have volcanic eruptions and they are uh, usually eruptions from fissures in the level ground, not necessarily, necessarily from large volcanoes, but in between the volcanoes, you can have eruptions anywhere through such fissures. And we have one going on at the moment in the Southwest Peninsula, which is called Geldingadalir. And uh, this is a, a sort of a gem. It's a very small, nice volcanic eruption going smoothly, no uh, large explosions. And it's been attraction. But when we get the uh, eruptions uh, below the glacier, it will have a lot of explosions through boiling water and melting ice. And a lot of volcanic ash or other material blown over the, uh, over the land. This is a close up of this same uh, volcanic eruption. <clears throat> Now, in 2010, we had a, an infamous volcanic eruption in the volcano Eyjafjallajökull. And it uh, uh, stopped uh, air traffic in Western Europe and the larger area for weeks in 2010. The only uh, airport in Western Europe that was open at that time was the one in uh, Keflavik in uh, Southwest Iceland. And when these uh, glaciers, uh, subglacial eruptions occur, they melt a lot of ice and this water has to come down in large floods, what we call Jökulhlaup internationally, which is the Icelandic word for such uh, uh, for such uh, happenings. Now, and they bring enormous material, mat uh, amount of material with them. And this used to be a lake before the eruption, but within hours after the start of the eruption, it was completely filled with debris, the lake, and not only filled, but uh, at the root of the, uh, the terminus of the glacier, 
it was rising 50 meters higher than the previous uh, surface of the lake. And this is usually a coarse grained material. As you can see on this photograph, this is one of the grains that came down with a flood. Now, there are uh, about 14 ice caps in Iceland that send out outlet glaciers like this one, which is coming from the ice cap Myrdalsjökull, and it covers one of the most active volcanoes in Iceland. It has erupted on the average about two times a century, and every time it erupts, it melts a lot of ice, and gives rise to large, very large Jökulhlaups, which are river floods. And uh, these floods have many times exceeded the discharge of the Amazon River. So every now and then we have the largest river in the world in Iceland. And this, uh, uh, these are the largest river floods that have occurred on the uh, on earth uh, in historical time so the last eruption there was in 1918 so it is overdue for the next eruption by some standard but uh, we can't order the volcanoes to behave as we have uh, uh, we, as we have uh, deduced from their history. But you can see that this outlet glacier, Solemyukul, that we will visit before the uh, start of the workshop, that it has changed in size through time. And you see the lateral moraines and the terminal moraines that show its previous size in many cases. And this is what it looked like from the side in 1997. And during this time, following the 1997, which has been a very warm period, the glaciers have shrunk. As I will show you now in, uh, <clears throat> in a quick succession, what happened the next 13 years. And you see the uh, year on top of the photograph. So in 13 years, it completely disappeared from this vantage point. But during most of the history of Iceland, uh, we have had the other way around. During the Little Ice Age, which may have lasted from about 1300 to 1900, on, uh, not very exact, the glaciers in Iceland were growing on the average. So what the situation was at that time, what Icelanders mostly observed was this thing. Glaciers were advancing over uh, fertile areas and even farms. So people did not expect anything nice from the glaciers. It was floods and advancing glaciers. And there were a menace and a life-threatening menace too. So uh, nobody in Iceland about 150 years ago would have wanted anything more than getting rid of the glaciers. Nowadays, it's the other way around. We don't want the glaciers to disappear. But they are anyhow because of the activity of human race on the earth. So this is our real reality appearing in seconds. Now, glaciers are of uh, many different kinds, or a few different kinds. We have, for example, uh, 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 non-searching, non-search type glaciers, and on the other side, the search type glaciers. This is a search type glacier, and if you notice the smooth surface of the glacier, it changed in one year or just a few months actually, to a brimming ocean of ice, 
because it was surging. It all of a sudden advanced by a kilometer or so. And you can see how the smooth surface changes into, if you see the mountain knob in front of the glacier right here, it is below the glacier here on this photograph. So the glacier advanced over the landscape and uh, turned the surface into a brimming ocean of ice. Very, very crevassed. And this is what a glacier front looks like when it's uh, surging. And you see that this tiny fellow, he is not very careful. He doesn't know when this chunk of ice falls down. But I can assure you he's still alive though. <clears throat> and inside the glacier, the water is running or down below the glacier. And when the, in the fall, when the rivers subside, uh, they leave tunnels in the glacier and they can be very beautiful indeed. Now, we have also, of course, uh, uh, vegetation in Iceland. Supposedly, all uh, vegetation disappeared from the country during the Ice Age. We don't know if there were uh, isolated non attacks with some vegetation at the end of the Ice Age, but now it's been covered by uh, many kinds of uh, vegetation. We have about 500 different species of, of uh, the flora. And here's one of them. The seeds are ready to be blown away. They look like a mustache, but the wind is left to disperse this over the country and it's doing a very good job because this plant is growing all over the country. And Icelanders, uh, uh, well, in Iceland we have about 80 breeding birds. The favorite one is the golden plover. And this is the chick of the golden plover. And as you can see, the children love to hold one in their hands. Whether it's, uh, it may not be feasible, but they can't stop it. And of course, we have uh, the insect fauna as well. And this is the bum Icelandic bumblebee or the small bumblebee, which was the only bumblebee living in Iceland. It was the only uh, stinging insect for a long while. Uh, wasps were introduced to the country about 50 years ago for the first time. And now there are a few types of a uh, few species of wasps living here. <clears throat> In Iceland, we have only six species of mammals, land mammals. Reindeer is one of them. It was introduced in uh, 1770 from Norway and is a substantial uh, stock of, uh, by now, about 3,000, three to 5,000 animals uh, living in Iceland, wild. This is a reindeer calf, which did not quite make it. Its mother was gone when I arrived and there was nothing that could be done to save it. Now, this is a typical bunch of Icelanders of the age of zero to 80. This happens to be uh, a family reunion at my summer house in Northern Iceland. So, Something like this is what you would expect in Iceland, people-wise. Now, the history of Iceland is uh, only about 1,200 years of Icelanders, that is to say, because the settlement started in the 870s, presumably, possibly a sporadic uh, 
uh, people or sailors have come to the coast of the country before that, but the settlement era was in 874 to 9.30. At 9.30, the parliament was established at Thingvedlif and a commonwealth as well. There was no uh, chieftain uh, ruling the country. It was a legislative body. And in uh, 985, Eric the Red was expelled from Iceland because of manslaughter, and he established a settlement in Greenland. In the year 1000, Christianity was established as a straight religion. And the same year, Leifur Eriksson, Leif Eriksson explored Vinland, the east coast of North America, North America. We wrote the first law book in 1117. The king of Norway uh, got to rule Iceland by 1262, and that was the end of the Icelandic Commonwealth. Black Death invaded in 1402, about 30, 40 years after it had raged in Europe, other parts of Europe. And Lutheranism was introduced forcefully in 1550 by the execution of uh, the last Catholic bishop with his two sons. Of course, it sounds a little strange that a Catholic bishop has children, but, but uh, we were with, uh, uh, we were outside the reach of the Vatican. Uh, we had the first nationwide census in the world in 1703, and the huge eruption of Lachie, uh, volcano in 1783 caused haze famine in Iceland and the haze affected climate worldwide. There was a famine in Japan and this eventually led to the revolution of, uh, in France in eight, 1789. And this was the summer of the red sun in China. So it was circumpolar effect of this volcanic eruption, of course, uh, Icelanders felt it very badly because they lost about one third of the nation. Now we had our first constitution in 1874, our first local government of one minister in 1904, autonomy established under the Danish king in 1918, and then Icelandic Republic independent of Denmark in 1944. Now, we have always been very interested in uh, writing uh, from the beginning of the nation. It's particularly where we interested in history. In uh, a famous Danish uh, script from uh, year 1200, is, uh, the historian is uh, describing the uh, the kings of Europe, and at the end he says, if people want to know more about the European kings, they have to go to Iceland. Records of settlement were written in the early 1100s, and an essay uh, by an anonymous writer <clears throat> was written on the initiate uh, on how the alphabet was thought through by the initiator of the Icelandic alphabet. And it's extraordinary to have uh, the history of the written language uh, recorded by the originator. The law of the Commonwealth was established in 930, and uh, it was uh, memorized by the lawman, and he exclaimed the law, one third of the law every year. Uh, and it, they had to be memorized until it was written down in 1117. We wrote down the history of Norwegian and Danish kings. We preserved the traditional poetry of Northern Europe. And the Prose Edda is the main source of the Norse, myth, North, Norse mythology. Annals, we wrote annals for the beginning of the human race to the contemporaneous of that annal. And Icelandic sagas which are the most famous of those writings. 
are novels of heroes, statesmen, and general people during the first centuries of Icelandic history. Contemporary history was written in the 12th and the 13th century, and uh, religious liter literature and history of bishops. So we made uh, by, uh, by manuscripts by the tens of thousands, but not more than one tenth of it is still existing. And the largest book that we have were, needed more than a hundred calves to be slaughtered. So it was extremely expensive. And here is a, uh, an image of uh, one of those manuscripts. And the text of this can be read and understood by all Icelandic school children. Now, Icelanders are singing people because we didn't have much of musical instruments. And the perfect fifth is interval is a big favorite in the Icelandic folk songs. Björk is a worldwide celebrity in music by now, and Hildur Guðnadóttir won the Oscar Academy Award last year, and many other awards. So we are quite active in music. Uh, the lullabies in Iceland, they go in minor key and can be very frightening, actually. I have sung these songs to all of my children. I don't know where, whether they sing that to their children. If we, uh, we shall not be loud, my dear, here are many things to fear. I have heard the whole night through someone breathing at the window. We Hér er margt að ykka, ég hef heikt í alla ná, hann þarf á þá glugga. And then again, many things the darkness knows, my mind is burdened. Frequently I saw the black sand scorch the green meadow. In the glacier, the deadly deep crevices are moaning. How nice to sing this to your children. Það er margt sem mér kryð veit, minn er hugur þungur. Oft ég svartan sandin leit, svíða grænan engi reit. Í öklinum hljóða dauða djúpar sprungur. Now, we are quite fond of team sports like football and handball. We have won the unofficial world championship of bridge, the Bermuda Bowl in 1991, silver medal in handball at the Olympics, and uh, we will not mention the rest, rest of it. We are a fishing nation, and this is the record of the catch for the last uh, 40 years or so. And we, this is, Close to being 1% of the world catch. The Icelandic waters are very windy because of the high pressure in, over Greenland and the low pressure in the North Atlantic. So it's constantly windy in Iceland. This is a trawler going out to uh, sea for fishing. And there are small boats as well. And the main uh, stock, the most important stock is the cod. Now, Iceland is the land of ice, of course. This is rime frost, rime ice on a pond in my vicinity. And this is the ins inside of an ice chunk, which you will be probably going to see uh, in, uh, uh, in your trip. And here's a family that is in agony, farmer and his wife and maiden and uh, work worker and the children, and Snoopy is down here. And they're worrisome because there's a dragon that's chasing them with small eyes and tongue hanging out and a long tail. But the horse on the upper right hand is going to save the whole family in one uh, jump. So this is a, 
uh, folklore frozen within the ice chunk, which is about size of a couple of inches. And the morning dew in the, in the late summer shows uh, droplets on a spider web. And there is a, a clover leaf down below out of focus, but you can see it is in focus in every droplet because droplets are lenses, work as lenses. So in large and stuff. Yeah. And this is uh, the end of the talk. Thank you. All right. Next we had on the agenda was a little bit of Icelandic words. Uh, okay. I'm going to uh, I'm going to show some uh, papers. Can you see it or have I um, yeah, why don't you stop sharing your screen and then yes. we can highlight you. But I have two slides. Oh, I okay. do slides more to show. Okay. I'm going to show it to you now, and uh, and I'm going to work out like that. Okay, it's, that looks good. It's yeah. it's in the the words and the pronunciation. Beautiful. And then I have another. Hold on tight. Very good. Uh, I have a so. Okay, <laughs> I have one more slide. Okay, uh, I'm going to stop sharing. And uh, now I'm going to show you this. Let's see how can I? Yes. Uh, I'm going to teach you a few words before you come to Iceland. And uh, I'm going to show you the words, although you have it on the slide. Uh, this is the first words I'm going to teach you because we use them always to uh, say to people when we meet them on a walking or hiking path, then we say, go and dark. You can mute your and try to say it. Go and dark. Go and dark. Uh, the next word I'm going to teach you is a canary. I'm a teacher and I'm going to teach you uh, uh, Icelandic words to use when you come to the excursion or to the uh, uh, yeah, when you come to Iceland with Iceland and you have to use some words. And I'm going to teach you and this is teacher canary. Uh, you come to Iceland with an airplane. And that's the Icelandic word about airplane. It is flugvél. Flugvél. It's airplane. Flugvél. And when you come to Iceland at these times, this time, then you have to go to uh, to uh, what's it called quarantine. Yes, you have to take a quarantine in COVID. Hopefully not. <laughs> yes, I hope not. But the bird is very very cute. It's soft qui, soft qui. We have uh, two Icelandic words, nay letters. O and E, sótt kví, quarantine. And uh, then you will be asked if you, had, if you have had vaccination. Vaccination, I have on my workbook here. <laughs> uh, then you will be asked if you have been vaccinated and it is bólusetning. I see you are trying to say it. Good, Julia. Yes. <laughs> uh, 
uh, well, now you go uh, from the airport and you try to get some uh, uh, transportation to Reykjavik because you land in Keflavik or you have to go to Reykjavik because all hotels and uh, everything is in Reykjavik. And then you have to get a bus. In Icelandic, it is a ruta, ruta, bus, ruta. <laughs> yes. Uh, but if you don't want to go with ruta, with bus, then you will try to take a taxi. And the taxi is in Icelandic, leigubíll. Leigubíll, it's taxi. Leigubíll. Well, now we are going, we are going uh, to, we have to go to the restroom. And we have to ask about the restroom in Iceland. Then you say, where is the restroom closet? Where is closet? Closet. Restroom. Closet. Well, off we go. We are, we are arriving to Reykjavik and we want to have some breakfast. And the, the breakfast is Morgun matur in Icelandic. Morgun matur. Morgun matur. It's not very difficult. Everything, not Icelandic letters or nothing like that. Morgun matur. Uh, well, we are come. We are getting our morgun matur, and we come to the word you have already used. It is a buffet, buffet, buffet. It's hladborð. It's it's a table with a bunch of uh, uh, food on it, everything. But then it's called hladborð. Buffet. We have a special letter here, F, which is special Icelandic letter, F, Hlaðborð. Well, we have to pronounce Reykjavík, right? Reykjavík. It is a, it's a little, it's a little bay with a smoke on it. The first uh, smoky, smoky town, <laughs> smoky bay, Reykjavík, our first uh, land, land settled, yes, uh, named it so because it's so smoke on the land. Uh, now we are getting hungry and we want to get some meat or meals or something like a dinner or something. Then we have to search for a restaurant. And a restaurant in Icelandic is waiting a hus. Waiting a hus. Waiting a hus. A restaurant. Uh, and in the waiting a hus in the restaurant, we want to get some water. This is a very difficult uh, word because it has some uh, Icelandic, special Icelandic pronunciation. Uh, we have to use our nose and the uh, tongue and it is vat. Vat. Use your nose. <laughs> vat. Water, what? Water. Water, what? Okay. Uh, now we are going to take a trip to to the excursion place, and uh, we see many glaciers, and you will have to 
uh, know the word for glaciers in Iceland. Or it is, it's, it's also a bit difficult. It's jökull. You have to use your tongue. Jökull. Jökull. Yes, either left or right. Jökull. Glacier. It's one glacier. Jökull. If we are using in plural, plural, then it's jöklar. Jöklar. And I, I also had to uh, try to teach you the most difficult word in well, 10 years. It yeah. was the eruption in Eya Fjalla Jökull. <laughs> Eya Fjalla Jökull. You see Jökull. Uh, Eya Fjall. We have a question, Colbrin, about the yeah. two L's together, the sound of those. It's a... Okay, thank you. And then we have maybe we will have the eruption when you arrive after about after a one year uh, then i have to teach you the word that so you can get there the the eruption is in geldinga dalir geldinga dalir it's a bit different <laughs> It's, it's like Eya Fjalla Jökull, Geldinga Dali, uh, just a little bit easier. And at last we have to, uh, we have to pronounce the, uh, the place we are going to meet in Höp, Höp and uh, try to say Höp, Höp and then blow your nose when you pronounce the last one hop hop <laughs> blow your nose hop yeah. uh, not not happen hop you you heard the difference hop you have to, you have to have to practice before you come here be because no one will understand you <laughs> when you're going to happen <laughs> you're going to hop okay and uh, then i say we have to have to learn that it is thank you thank you uh, Tak fyrir matin. Han var góður. Thank you for this meal. It was good. Tak fyrir matin. When you leave the restaurant, you say, Tak fyrir matin. Han var góður. Thank you for the meal. It was really nice. Okay? And when you leave, you say, Góða nótt. You say good night, góða nótt. And when you meet in the morning, you say good day, not good morning. It's always good day, góðan dag, good day, góðan dag, góðan dag, góða nótt. Okay. I don't think I have more to teach you at the moment, but that's a lot. Yes. Lots to learn. Okay. Thank you. We yes. have to practice. Yes. <laughs>
definitely have to practice. Okay. I think we had a couple of other questions. So is it question officially time now? Yes. Um, so we did have a question earlier uh, about the glaciers and um, perhaps Icelandic people's thoughts about the glaciers uh, going away. Um, let's see, where was that question? Why don't you want the glaciers to disappear? So, um, Besides just thinking about the uh, climate change glacier disappearing, um, perhaps you would feel, feel comfortable discussing that? Yes. Uh, I, the, uh, the glaciers are a very uh, obvious and uh, large part of the scenery in Iceland. And uh, the large glaciers uh, the areas of the large glaciers would certainly not look right if the glaciers had disappeared. They are majestic and they are beautiful in form and they are extremely interesting as a natural phenomena. And they also contain uh, history. You can extract uh, climate history and uh, volcano, uh, volcanic history out of the glaciers. And when the glaciers have melted, none of this is left. It is, is, has run to the ocean and will never be retreated after that. So uh, it is a part of the identity of Iceland, of course, the glaciers. So we are fond of them now, but as I said before, about 150 years ago, when the glaciers were advancing, they were a menace indeed and a huge menace. So at that time, almost all Icelanders would have wanted them uh, away. Was there another question? I think we had answered a couple of the other ones. Um, I'm looking to see in the chat if there was something else, but if you have a question to ask, feel free to unmute yourself if you would like to. We also have a video that we were going to share. Ah, yes. So. Regina had a question as well. Mm -hmm. hey. Hello, I'm- Hi, Regina. Hi, my name is Regina. I'm in Northern California. And yes. I'm wondering if you have been to the volcano that's currently erupting. No, no, no. Yes. Well, uh, Colburn has been there four times. I've only been there once. So it, it's easy to get to? Yeah, uh, it is uh, an hour's hike each way from the road. Now they are making dikes to try to stop the lava from reaching the road. Oh. Because if it goes that way, it will cross uh, and uh, interrupt the traffic and several other things uh, that are infrastructure that is going to be in the way. So if uh, uh, that may happen within a few weeks if they don't stop it, but eventually it will come down. There is no way of stopping a volcanic uh, eruption forever, but you can divert the lava flow for some time and hope it stops before it overrides the dikes. Thank you. Um. Reinhardt is asking, is Icelandic a Celtic language, uh, like Welsh, Irish, or Scottish? No, uh, Icelandic is mostly Germanic language. Mm -hmm. It is the, uh, it was uh, at the settlement of Iceland, it was a common language in uh, Scandinavia and also in British Isles. So, uh, um, an Icelander could make himself understood at the English court before the uh, before 1066, the Battle of Hastings, where William the Conqueror took over and made it half French. 
So uh, we spoke this, uh, uh, one of the old authors said that Icelandic was a Danish language. So we had the same language as Norway, exactly. We came more or less from that place. Mm -hmm. But on the way to Iceland, they uh, often stopped by in the Hebrides or Ireland or Scotland and took some slaves to bring along with them. And some of them were women which give birth to uh, to uh, uh, Norwegian uh, Celtic uh, ancestors. And uh, so actually uh, they have found out that uh, the Ice, uh, Icelandic people is descended from about 90% of uh, Norwegian or Norse uh, people, men, but 60% from Gaelic women, uh, Celtic women. Hmm. So I hardly believe that, but because if the mothers were uh, mainly Celtic, there would be much more words in Icelandic of that uh, origin. Hmm. But this still remains to be uh, studied more. Very interesting, the idea of studying, yeah, the language um, and the etymologies, yeah. Yes. <laughs> Are we ready for the video? I think we should be coming up on, yeah, an hour in just a few minutes. All right. I'm going to go ahead. Let me know if you can't hear it. The largest town on the way to Hapn is Selfos, with about 6,000 inhabitants. And through the town, there runs the largest river in Iceland, about 400 cubic meters per second. I'm not seeing the average. video. Okay, let me okay. start over again. Thanks. So we should probably mention Colbrin is giving us an overview of our trip from Reykjavik to Hop. <laughs> on the 12th of April next year. <laughs> All right, let me try it again here. Quick time player, share sound. All right, now it should work, I hope. The largest town on the way to Hapn is Selfos with about 6,000 inhabitants. And through the town, there runs the largest river in Iceland, about 400 cubic meters per second on average. Hedla is another town, mostly for uh, agricultural area, which we will see ample of on the way. And here we'll see, we're seeing how the rocks are falling down from the uh, hillsides. And it's amazing that they have built a farm in this surroundings. Here we are going on to the one of the great sander plains, which is coming from Solomyukul, which we are seeing here, and we will be visiting this glacier front on the wall, on the way. It is uh, the glacier that goes farthest to the south in Iceland. And uh, it is about uh, 150 years old, the ice in it. And here you see in the area where uh, the glacier has recently left that the hardiest plants are trying to get foothold on the sander. Most of these flowers are quite beautiful in color. As you can see, there is always wind in Iceland, or almost always. This is one of the windiest places in the world. And the plants cannot be very high or have a harder time if they are high to endure the wind.
Solomjökull has uh, had uh, a new lagoon forming in front of it, which is taking a lot of ice for melting. And on top of the glacier, there is uh, black ash, volcanic ash from uh, the eruption of 1918. And there are many tourists that pass onto the glacier every day, or more or less every day, even thousands of them. And uh, the glacier ice is a very, very clean stuff, All, although you have this black patches on top of it. It's only volcanic sand that you can wash off, and then you have very uh, clear and nice ice inside it. And this ice is about 150 years old. So it takes this glacier about a century and a, century and a half to uh, uh, renew its material. And here you see how clean and clear this ice can be. It is made out of crystals, ice crystals. As said before, this is an agricultural area that we will be running through, and the main stock is dairy cows. This is the village of Vik, which has grown enormously during the last decades because of increased tourism. And just east of Vik, there is this hotel, Kjernigadalur or, or Hörabrekka, which uh, will uh, be our uh, lunch place during the trip. And then we go on to the one of the largest thunder plains in the uh, in southern Iceland, which has seen very many times the largest river floods that are known in the world. The discharge of the river of this river increases by about ten thousand times, and in. Uh, Jökulsor Lón, the Glacier Lagoon, there is a, a photo show on the banks of the lagoon, which is done by the friends of Vatnajökull, ice cap. And here's the coast where many of the icebergs wash ashore, and uh, they can be very interesting if you are looking close into it. There are unbelievable figures that you see within those ice chunks. And this is the um, largest discharge river in Iceland. It's only 400 meters long, but it's uh, such large discharge because the tide is going in and out twice every day. So it goes up to about 4,000 cubic meters per second, uh, 10 times more than the largest river on, on average. And this is the glacier lagoon, or Jokos alone, with the glacier behind, which is giving off all those icebergs. Before we reach Hapn, we'll stop by on a uh, uh, museum, which is uh, uh, been named for the one of the most popular authors or novelists in Iceland, Thorbergur Thorðarsson. He was very interested in Esperanto, and one of his books is exactly named Esperanto. And on the keel of those books, or book images, you see the name of the, or titles of the book that he wrote during his lifetime. One of them is the Steinarnitala, or the stones, talking stones, 
So uh, this is an image of the talking stone that is sitting outside the museum, and it's talking all the time. That was beautiful. Thank you so much. Um, yes, packing some wind protection gear. <laughs> Yes, I think you that's important. That ready. It's easy to take off, but if, if you don't have it, it's not easy to take on. Wind blocking clothing. Got it. <laughs> well, thank you very, very much. I think we had one ending slide with the dates of the upcoming events. Um, our next event uh, is actually happening now. If you want to go ahead and run the distance or help us contribute kilometers from our previous conference location in Cambridge, UK, uh, to get us to Hof Hofen. Um, I think we have 2000 kilometers that we need to register. So please feel free to run, walk, hike, paddle, bike, I don't know, pogo stick, whatever you would like. Uh, we are, it's a, a yeah, do it often, frequently, uh, just contribute your miles, well, uh, sorry, kilometers to help us get there. Our, uh, that uh, link is open to go ahead and register for that. Our next one coming up, which we don't have the link to register just yet, will be the 20th of June, and it's commemorating the solstice and every year, the change between summer and winter, depending on which hemisphere you are in. Um, that's going to be our Sci Arctic Soiree, Sorry, <laughs> trying to speak too many different uh, unfamiliar words has my tongue tied. Um, that will be running a little bit over an hour, I think a couple hours long. Uh, next up would be starting around August, our education tech taster sessions. So thinking about the technology and digging into things that work well. Um, and then the 22nd through the 23rd of September, a very, um, yeah, <laughs> intense 24 hours of Polar Science share -thon. So we've got some great uh, presentations lined up. Uh, we're hoping to use technology and uh, use, um, I've forgotten the link, the app uh, to um, make sure that we have a feeling of it actually happening live, but we might be uh, sharing those events on as they're recorded, but then updating every hour, a new event to happen. Uh, October 17th is our actual conference registration online party. So if you are on that event on the 17th of October, you will get a pre early bird discounted rate if you register on that day. Uh, so we have some events uh, lined up and thinking about sharing a little bit more. Um, of course, it's a registration party. So thinking about um, appropriate adult beverages or snack items that would be appropriate for that. On Antarctica Day, switching to the opposite part of the world, thinking about Antarctica Day and sharing that, we are celebrating December 1st uh, with glacier stories. So um, hearing more about glaciers uh, from and other experts uh, around the world. So we hope you register with us. Um, if you are not currently a member of PEI, we would invite you to uh, log in and join us officially. Um, if you are interested in taking a more active part in Polar Educators International and the running of it, we still have four more days to apply for a spot on our council. So coming up, if you'd like to contribute to the work and help guide things going forward, we would love to have you. So feel free to find that link also on our website. So thanks for joining us today. Um, we will probably make this recording available very shortly so we can all, thank you, practice those words and take it the word list again. And um, yes, hope to see you all in Reykjavik. <laughs> And we will get uh, Coburn and Oder's slides so we can have all of those words to practice with. And we'll send yes. them out. And the pronunciation. I'm going to click that button often. <laughs> Put it in the car yes. and you drive. 
<laughs> I, I'll send this to you. Okay. <laughs> Thank, Thank you for being much. patient Thank with you. us. <laughs> Thank you. Have a good day. All right. You all too. Thank I you. Know. Goodbye. Mm -hmm.